What's going on, Fight Fans? It's your boy Tijon here for another rendition of In the Mix. All right, so man, what we're going to talk about today, of course, we're going to talk about the UFC Fight Night uh, Walker versus Hill. And it was a very, very cool uh, card. It surprised me, honestly. I don't think a lot of people were going to pay a lot of attention to it, but from the prelims all the way to the main card, it was, you know, it was still a really decent card. Um, a lot of surprises, um, you know, some surprising knockouts that we saw that I definitely wasn't ready for. And, and you know, I just was, I'm glad that I tuned in, and I'm sure a lot of people are too. And I have to say, I'm really happy with, you know, the maturity that I'm seeing in the UFC and its fighters. Like, you know, we're always going to be happy about how, you know, um, we're always going to be happy about the the big scraps that we get where it's just, you know, people just hitting each other, trying to knock each other out. But I'm liking how it's becoming more of a technical, um, a technical driven sport. You know, it's a lot more tactful. It's a lot more um, skill based. And, you know, I can appreciate that just seeing seeing the growth in the sport and seeing the growth in a lot of the fighters, it's it's very much more of a mature sport than it was in the beginning. And yeah, that could lead to sometimes it being boring, but if you're watching it in a points-based and just like an art form, it's still very entertaining, so it just takes a different thought process. But, you know, the more you watch it, the more you'll you'll get into that too. But for the, the regular fight fans, yeah, it'll, it'll be a little trying sometimes. That was kind of what we saw this one. But I truly had no complaints over it. I thought that it was a really fun card and it was a lot more entertaining than even I thought. So if you haven't watched it, definitely check it out. But let's get into the recap first, man. So starting with the prelims, we had the first match being Mario Batista versus Jay Perrin. Now, this fight was, you know, it, it wasn't one-sided. Like, they had some pretty decent scraps in the beginning. But, I mean, Batista really controlled the pace. It was a high wrestling output. You know, it was really him controlling the pace from from the corner. That's all you really saw in in this match, I got to say. Um just because he controlled the tempo the entire fight, um you know, it was somewhat of an easy win for him. You know, it wasn't like there was any debate on the fact that he was winning the fight. He actually hit him with some solid moves, a lot of really hard hits from the clinch, but most of this fight, I mean, yeah, like 90% of this fight was from the cage, just like right on the, on the fence. They're just, just like grappling him down, hitting him with some big shots, but really just controlling him right there. So of course he, he got the win. There was no real debate on that. Just a really strong showing, really decisive win. Like I said, it wasn't the most entertaining fight, but you know, it was a dominant win. So he definitely gets the nod. And, you know, we're going to look for him to get some some tougher fights from now on because it wasn't really much of a competition. Like I said, man, it was just really just a super easy win for him, it looked like. He didn't really, like you see, there's no sweat on him. He didn't exert himself too much. He just, it just dominated. He just went off of points. So, you know, not really too much to say about it. Just a good win. So moving on to the next one. This one was a bit more interesting. Jonathan Pierce versus Christian Rodriguez. Now, Christian Rodriguez was coming into this fight undefeated, and uh, Jonathan Pierce was going to be his first real test, like big challenge kind of. And, I mean, these both, both of these guys are strong wrestlers, and you could see that in their scrambles in the first round. But, honestly, like, Jonathan Pierce just started, you know, dominating in the wrestling compartment, and Christian Pierce had to dig into his jiu-jitsu, which was working. I mean, I honestly don't know how Christian Pierce – didn't finish this. You can see it right here. Like the guillotine is locked in. I don't know what's going on in the world of MMA and why the guillotine is so ineffective in the MMA world. I I truly don't understand because he actually did everything that he was supposed to do. He crunched to his side, you know, made it a blood choke and somehow pierced muscle through it. I truly don't get it. Like the guillotine is one of the most like use submissions that we've seen but it's also not really used correctly but i feel like pierce did a pretty good job in in doing it but it just wasn't working out for him 
there was a lot of scrambling in the beginning of uh, in the in that first round. Like I said, it was a lot of wrestling, a lot of jujitsu, and um, you know, but it still kept the fight entertaining. In that first round, also we got to see like a body lock from uh, Pierce, and he just was wild, like just going to town on him. But it was that was mainly how the fight went. You know, it was a lot of wrestling as the rounds went on. Clearly, Rodriguez started getting tired, so Pierce just took advantage of that wrestling into the ground grappling just winning off of points um christian pierce did everything that he could like i said with his jujitsu skills he tried to get an arm bar it was kind of weak um pierce easily got out of that one but i mean he just continued to try to you know make stuff work off the ground because he realized he wasn't going to get up off the ground pierce was just too strong and too dominant on the ground so he just tried to you know adapt to that and pierce realized that and just capitalized that was really the majority of the fight it, it you know you just saw christian pierce on top and you know <laughs> gonzalez doing whatever he could to make this fight interesting i mean he knew he needed some kind of submission or win and every submission that he tried it just wasn't getting the job done unfortunately so like i said uh christian pierce ended up getting that win it was a tough win. It was, you know, a really good showing for him, another dominant performance for him. And I'm sure this was a big learning experience for um, Christian Rodriguez. He's going to have to work on his wrestling, have to work on his takedown defenses and all that, because like I said, he came into this fight undefeated. So, you know, this is, this is just another stepping stone that he can use to become, you know, to get back to himself. Hopefully he doesn't get too far in his head because it was literally just a wrestling match here. So as long as he gets back into the gym and really focuses on what um, took place here, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. There was nothing wrong with his stand-up. There wasn't any glaring things other than the fact that he couldn't um, out-wrestle somebody who's a clearly better wrestler. So really nothing bad with that. I don't have anything too, you know, damning to say there. It was a good fight. And, you know, he did, he did what he could, but it just wasn't enough to get the win. So moving on to the next one. We had this one I was actually, uh, I had a good time with. Jesse Strader versus Chad and and Anna Liger, I think it is. Anna Liger. Anna Liger, that's the one. But this was a really good one. So Chad has been, uh, was being praised a lot because he has a lot more experience. He started out, I think, two and five and has been on a hot streak, winning like nine in a row or something like that, 19 in a row, something crazy like that. Hasn't lost since his um his fifth loss. And he finally got the call up and has not disappointed yet. Jesse Strader is a dominant wrestler. So this was a this was gonna be a real test though for Chad and Jesse alike. It was a it was it was really fun match to see. It was really fun on paper as well. Um, you know, as usual between wrestlers, you see it immediately go to the ground. Who who was gonna wrestle who more? And Jesse actually got the takedown first. And he was able to get knee taps off of him. Like it, the first round was pretty a pretty solid performance from Jesse. He got caught in a little guillotine. It wasn't as you know dangerous as the last one that we saw. But you know you can't ever walk off the submission. You never know what you're gonna get caught with. Strader escaped it. You know, and then they had a real good scrap in the last uh, minute of the first round. Like that was probably the most entertaining part of the fight until the end. Um, we saw a big right hand hurt uh, hurt Jesse. That swung the whole momentum into Chad's favor. I got to say, like, I was expecting that from, from Jesse from what we saw in his wrestling, because usually wrestlers have the, the more powerful hands. But Chad really surprised me. He hit him with, like, this big right hand. And, you know, Jesse did the smart thing, kind of held him down, recovered, continued to scrap for the rest of the second round, tried to recover it. But at this point, it was one and one. In my opinion, it was a really close fight. Um, but I think that Jesse started getting a little cocky. And I think that he thought that that was going to be the end of it, which was a mistake, to say the least. You know, he started letting off the gas in the third round, man. And like we said, like I said earlier, like in, in previous reviews, man, the last thing you want to do when you're going into a fight, regardless, is let off the gas, even if you're winning, because you you know that the other person is desperate. They're going to have to get a win. But this was really even. And even though it was a close fight, you know, nobody wants it to go to the judges because the judges could be seeing one thing and you could be seeing another. 
So um, Chad did what he had to do, man. He rocked him. He rocked him almost like midway through, hit him with, with a vicious hook, I believe, put him down, hit him with some grounding powder, and it was over. TKO dubbed for, for Chad, man. And I mean, Jesse was mad. <laughs> Jesse was actually mad at the ref. But if you look at the tape, man, Jesse was out. If he took any more hits, I mean, all it would have did was brain damage. Chad won the fight. And it's because Jesse kind of let off the gas. Like I said, I guess he thought he did enough to win the first two rounds and he thought he could coast. And, you know, Chad, with his experience, I guess he's been screwed over sometimes in those five losses that he got. And, re- and he knows not to let the judges, you know, score it. Don't don't ever let a fight go to the judges. You have to make sure that no matter what, you know that you won the fight and you don't leave any doubt. The best way to do that, finish your opponent. And Chad did that. So kudos to Chad, man. He's he's still on his win streak. I'm rooting for him. I think that he's a he's a really big draw for the for the UFC. You know, he has a really good comeback story, and I love to see it continue. So, you know, I'm happy. I'm happy for how this went. And so let's get into the next one, man. Diana, Diana the Belbita versus Gloria De Paula. Now, this was um a scrap. You know, this was all stand up. I got to say, it was a little bit of wrestling involved, like near the end. But the first round and and the the first two rounds, I got to say, were mainly you know standing up. Um, Gloria De Paula is the more, I guess, jujitsu slash wrestling savvy fighter because she did try a few times to get the um takedowns and ended up you know stuffing her into the cage and dominating that way. So the fight normally took place there. And so that's mainly what you saw in those first two rounds was her, you know, trying to control the pace and, you know, trying to get those takedowns wasn't working. So I'm gonna wrestle you other ways. I'm gonna dominate the clinch. I'm gonna like control where you are and, you know, stalk you that way. And, you know, Belbita was, you know, trying to do her thing. She accidentally, I mean, no, like you see, she was actually, um you know, stuffing a bunch of takedowns. So she was, she was really, you know, effective in, you know, stopping Belvita's game plan. You know, she did a very good job. I have to say it was after this accidental eye poke where things started kind of going awry. You know, whenever we see this kind of break, it seems that's when things start moving differently What to either direction. Like it can either spark a fire in the person that got um, got injured real quick, or it can go into the other fighter's favor because the person really can't see, or the nut shot was too much, and they just want to try to continue the fight. You know, it, it's it's multiple factors, but you know, once 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 a cheap shot or an accidental cheap shot happens, that kind of gets the fight going, and that's what we saw here. And once that happened, we saw a nice takedown from the Paula, and that kind of wrapped it up. Once that happened, you know, it, it it's scoring. You know, it wasn't like they were going to put each other out. That much was for sure. There was no um, big punches that, you know, hurt the other person. We could tell from after, like, midway through the second round that this was going to go the distance. And um, once the Paula got that takedown, it was kind of over for um for Belbita, but um it was still a close score, and you know they finished it out with some nice stand up, you know, just swinging it out in the in the middle of the ring. You know that's that's always good to see. You have one minute left. Let's see if we, see who can knock each other out because you know we've we've tried everything. So the best thing that we can do is just stand here and slug. I love when that happens. I love that last few uh, few seconds in, in the last round because that's when you really see them really try to put each other out, especially if, you know, you know it's a close fight and it can go either way. And that's what it was. But in my opinion, from from the second round on, I knew that DePaula had this fight. It came to a shock for Belvita, but I think everybody else knew who was watching the fight that DePaul won that fight only because of her superior wrestling. You know, if this was all scrapping, it really could have gone either way, but I would have been shocked if DePaul didn't get this fight. So congrats to her. She fought her fight. You know, that's all it is. If you if you go the distance, it goes to points, and you have to know how the points work. 
it's not all stand up. You can't just be in MMA and just do stand up. That's the whole thing about MMA. If you're just going to do stand up, go do boxing or kickboxing or something, you know, like if you're standing in the octagon, you have to have good wrestling ability or some jujitsu ability. You have to be able to score on the ground. You have to be able to control the fight in some way. If stand up doesn't work, you have to move to something else. And that's what we saw really in those in, in the fight so far, you know, I mean, all in the card. When the stand up wasn't working and it was too close, the fighters had to move to something else. And if the other fighter wasn't, you know, adept to that and just only had striking, they failed. And they were like looking like, I understand how I lost. Well, it's because all you had was striking. And the judges saw that. For once, I kind of agreed with all of the judges' um, decisions on this card. Not mad at it at all. I wasn't mad at the, the judges' um, decisions at all, which is extremely rare, you know? And I think that's extremely rare for anybody to say because the judges always mess up. Because once it goes to the judges, it's a preference thing, you know? And you don't want it to go to them because it's just like if we said something. So I don't, um, I don't like when fights always go to decision, but this time, like this card they did a really good job it was very fair i have to say I, i'll give credit to the judges and you know good job to depaul again for uh a real good showing once again she 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 did her fight and it worked out in her favor but moving on chas skelly and mark striegel now this was a good fight between um i, I would say a vet uh a newcomer i know their ages don't really make it seem like it but Chas Skelly has been in this game a while. Um, unfortunately, he's been plagued with a lot of injuries and a lot of issues outside of the ring. I mean, outside of the octagon, I should say, that have kept him away from fighting, you know? And because of that, he actually announced that this was his retirement fight. This was going to be his last fight, but he was going to try to go out with a bang. Um, Honestly, he did just that. This was a great fight. If I'm being completely honest, I hope that, you know, he gets the spark back. I know it's hard once, you know, you make that announcement and, you know, everything that goes on in life, um, he hasn't been able to fight as much. So the money isn't there. He's had to probably find other ways to make money. He kind of said that in his um, in his speech that he did after the fight. But I, I was I enjoyed watching him fight. So it, it'll be a shame if this is the way. He goes out, but at the same time, I'm I'm honestly proud of him because he ended it off in a very nice way. So getting into the fight, it was you know a lot of um a lot of wrestling. Striegel kind of controlled Skelly on the cage, but you know Skelly is a wrestler too, and Skelly was able to take him down, and that pushed the pace to a point that Striegel could not get through after the first round, like. Striegel just kept it on the ground from that point on. Uh, it, it was a long time, you know, <laughs> like it was just a dominant performance from there for Skelly when it came to, um, I would say, whenever it was on the feet, Striegel was on the cage. There, there, whenever they had any exchanges with the standup, it was pretty even. They weren't getting anywhere, like I said earlier. So, Skelly being the more experienced fighter knows, okay, I have to switch it up and I have to go to something else. He went to his wrestling, which clearly was working in the first round, went to it the second round, was gassing um, Mark Striegel, and, you know, he was just controlling the fight. Um, the, the more interesting part was he actually dropped Striegel with an elbow, like the elbow rocked him. He hit him with like this nice front elbow that we saw with Calvin Qatar a few weeks ago. And he kind of copied that style. I haven't seen Chas Skelly do that before. Then again, I haven't really watched Chas Skelly fight mo uh, often, I gotta say also admittedly. But with that front elbow, it really rocked Mark Striegel to the point where he got to the ground, Chas Skelly smelled blood and immediately went into the ground and pound and got the win. What a way to capitalize because Mark Striegel has been, you know, really told it as a danger to the division. And, you know, Chas Skelly did a really good job of, you know, humbling him. Like, you know, welcome to the UFC, kind of. That's what it felt like. It felt like a welcome to the UFC moment. 
And we don't really, like I said, we haven't really seen Chad Skelly that much, but he still is a vet. He still has a lot of experience, and that was on display. So I'm actually really, really happy with the fact that he won this match. What a way to go off. You know, this was a great way to cap off his career. And if he does come back, that would be great. I'm sure that, you know, any MMA promotion would be glad to have him, including the UFC, because this was a really dominant performance from him. But if he doesn't come back, I completely get it. You know, it was it was a lot for him. He's been going through a lot of stuff outside the ring, like I said, a lot of injuries. And so Philadelphia, anybody in Philadelphia, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give Chad Skelly a shout out. He does roofing. Give this man some money, you know, like let let this man fix your roof. I'm sure he's a good roofer. If his work ethic in the ring in the octagon has proved anything, is that he can do whatever uh, he wants and succeed. So you know, help this man succeed in his other um, endeavors. Hopefully, we see him again in the in the octagon, though. Even if it's not in the UFC, man, he's a great fighter. So I would love to see him continue his career. It was it, it's been a pleasure, but you know, I won't I won't go any further than that. <laughs> I don't want to get too far into it, but yeah, this was a, this was a, you know, it, it put my eyes on him, even though this was his last fight, it made me like watch him a little bit. And I'm happy that I did before he, he left, but moving on to the next one, Jessica Rose Clark versus Stephanie Yeager. This was surprising. I don't know if surprising is the right word because, um, more reminiscent. We haven't seen somebody do, what Ronda Rousey has done in a long time. And I'm a, I'm not going to leave it at that, but that should tell you something about how this fight went. This was very reminiscent of the Ronda Rousey days where Ronda Rousey just, you know, wiped out the division doing her own thing. And her own thing was what? Judo, do a throw, get an arm bar. You know, that's really what this fight was. And Stephanie Yeager did just that. You know, she's really good in judo. So um, that was on full display. But um, Jessica Rose Clark kind of did the, I wouldn't say foolish, but I don't think that this was the smartest tactic. I think you should have immediately put it on the ground. Don't put her on the cage. I know she tried to go for a takedown and um, Edgar kind of just waited it out, you know, got to the cage, moved her around and, you know, put her hips in place like a judo technician will do and was able to get a throw onto um clark which really that was the beginning of the end right there once she got jessica rose clark on the ground stephanie began to show off like there was nice ground and pound a lot of like you know ground control there was nothing that uh jessica could do and then agar ended up getting that arm bar which ended the fight immediately like you can see there's no getting out of that once that arm is straight them hips pop up it's a wrap it's a wrap for you there's nothing else that's gonna happen in that fight so this was a really dominant performance and like i said oh when ronda rousey was in her run before she got all in her head about you know being a striker which is unfortunate because ronda rousey was so so dominant this was exactly what ronda rousey was doing she used Stephanie Yeager used her expertise, her overwhelming expertise to you know, dominate her competition. Her judo is immaculate. She's a judo technician. Like I said, she's been practicing judo for years. So she uses that and her jujitsu that she knows to get the win. It's an easy win for her because if you can't stop the takedown and you can't stop her submission, it's a wrap. It doesn't have to be a scrap to be interesting and we saw that with Ronda Rousey for years and it was so upsetting when she started losing because it was like every match that she started losing from there it was all mental she I guess she was upset that she was known as the woman with no hands <laughs> even though that wasn't true she was able to knock a few people out but even that got to her head you know it's like stick to what you're really good at because if nobody can beat you at your style it makes you great I mean, what did um? That's exactly what Bruce Lee said. He doesn't fear the man that practices a thousand kicks. He fears the man that practices the one kick a thousand times. If you're good at that one thing and you can't be beaten at that one thing, why would you branch off into other stuff? That's gonna put you down a losing path. So I don't want to get on too much of a rant 
again, I'm super happy that we saw somebody like Ronda Rousey in the division because she gave me that like that vibe. Stephanie Yeager gives me that vibe. She um she did her game and she did it perfectly. And I feel like judo is a is a lost art. You know, not a lot of people practice it. And it's super dominant. You know, it's something that people should really get into because if you really watch that, there's there's nothing that you can do with it. It's all about your base, it's all about your hips. And if somebody can if somebody in, in the judo world gets you in wrestling, the judo, judo is going to beat wrestling every single time because it has everything to do with balance. Wrestling is more so muscle. Yes, there's a lot of technique involved too, but it's nowhere near as much as it is judo. So I enjoy watching technique more. Yes, um, you know, meatheadism <laughs> and, and, you know, just strength and fighting is always fun. But seeing the mind games and the chess games is much more interesting because it makes it that much more fun to watch. It's like, that's how you break somebody. And I like watching that. And Stephanie Yeager did a great job. So I see her going really far. Hopefully she gets a quick call up, a quick turnaround. Hopefully we see her a lot more this year. And she gets, uh, you know, some bigger matches because if she keeps that kind of performance up, she will be a contender as long as she has a chin. Because everybody that's in um that that has a belt in the women's divisions so far, some hands to them. So she's gonna have to you know work her game as long as she develops a chin or has one already, she'll be fine. And she just may you know dethrone somebody very soon. So I'm watching. I'm I'm watching Stephanie Yeager, and I'm I'll I'll put my um I'll put a little bit of faith in her right now. And if she's an underdog, best believe you probably should get into that because you might make some money on a on a title fight when that does happen. But let's move on to the best. Um, yeah, I would say the best preliminary fight, which was the last one, the <clears throat> David Omanama and Gabriel Benitez fight. Now, these two are known for having striking. Like that much was for certain from the jump. Um, I didn't really think that this match would 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 last long, and it surely didn't. It was only two rounds. Um, Benitez actually hurt Onama early in the first round and blinded him. He even came out in his interview and said like he couldn't see out of his um eye after that hook that he got. It wasn't a dirty punch. It was just perfectly timed and got him right in the eye. And Onama had trouble for the rest of the fight, just trying to figure out where he was, pick his punches and dodge and, you know, defend the way he was supposed to. But he did recover. Somehow he recovered. Second round was all David Onama. He just did a great, great job in, in this fight and ended up knocking him down. You know, it was, it was very apparent that he was going to win that fight. He just, like, he smelled blood. As soon as he hit him with that left hook, it was a wrap. He was wobbled. He was able to see that. He was able to see that Benitez was wobbled and just started slinging. I think that um, the the commentators actually counted, like, 18 punches consecutively thrown, all bombs, until he dropped or the ref stepped in. He was not going to stop that onslaught until the fight was over. And who could blame him? If he couldn't see out of that eye, I wouldn't want the fight to continue. So, you know, good on him. This was a great, great win for Onama. Um, I think he lost his last fight, and that was his debut. He took that fight short notice, so this was his, like, second chance, and he took full advantage. This was a great win for him. And to display the toughness, man, of, of Onama, that was great. This was a, like I said, this was a great, great win for him. I was very proud of that. And, um, you know, in that division, there's a lot of power. So Onama has uh, more work to do, but he definitely put the division on notice, on notice there too because he clearly has his own power and he has a lot in the tank going into the second round. It doesn't matter. You know, once he smells blood, there's going to be some adrenaline and you're going to get an onslaught, kind of like that Dustin Poirier feel. You know, it's, it's just going to keep coming and you better hope to God that somehow – he runs out and you're able to either recover 
or throw something back before the ref stops it. But like I said, that was, in my opinion, the most exciting match. It was it was quicker. It was probably the quickest match in the prelims, but it was exciting because we got to see both fighters get hurt and you know and Amar recovered for the comeback and got the win. That's always fun. I love I love stories like that. So yeah, I I'll, I'll give that the nod and um even on uh you know called out Dana White trying to get that bonus. Did he do enough to get a bonus? I don't know because the main cards was pretty good i gotta say this one was actually really good for the last few um fights in the ufc the prelims have been dominating the show if we're being a, if we're keeping it a stack so this was um this was different the main card was actually really really good the joaquin buckley and abdul razak al hassan fight was the very first one to open it up and they were really evenly matched I gotta say this was a really good um good fight between them now abdul is the older one but we've seen joaquin way more in the ufc than abdul but you know the stand-up was on display in the first round um it was a pretty even on the feet so like i said earlier what happens when um one fighter realizes that it's not going to go his way in the in the stand-up you go for the takedown and that's what joaquin did now joaquin is young like i think he said he's 27 years old I think he's about to turn 28. So he's super, he's super young in the sport. There's a lot of growth still. So to see that kind of awareness is great. That's that's really promising for him. So that's where the fight really took off from there. Joaquin just, you know, controlled the pace from that point. It was all wrestling in the first round. The second round was this here. He gassed Abdul, it looked like. It looked like Abdul had nothing left in him in that second round. And it really just went from, you know, um, Joaquin trying to find the finish to him just scoring. Because all that Abdul Razak Hassan did was shell up and try to defend and catch his breath, which, you know, didn't get any points and you're just letting Joaquin score. And that's all that ended up happening that fight. You know, that whole second round was Joaquin. And I think his corner let him know that. So Abdul came out that sec that that last round, that third round, knowing he needed to finish. He took down what jo- he took down Joaquin, and um, you know he he did everything possible to try to get a finish. And Buckley was kind of coasting, you know, he almost made that mistake and stayed on the ground while Abdul went to work that last round. He was beating the crap out of Joaquin, if we're if we're being completely honest. And because of that performance in the last round, it truly could have gone either way. Um, like I said, Abdul just like never let him up, had him with some vicious ground and pound, a few submissions that didn't work. I think that he should have stuck to the ground and pound and just, you know, hit him with some striking. And if it went back to the feet, took him back down. I think that would have earned him a few more points, maybe made it a little closer. Maybe he could have like switched the judges' opinions in the, in the past rounds, just off of his um, performance in the last round. But I think he just didn't do enough in this last round. But it definitely earned the respect between the two. It went the distance. Um, I think that it was a really great fight. It was, it was fun to watch. It was a great way to open up the main card. I thought that Joaquin was just going to, you know, beat him because I didn't know who Abdul was. But – you know, he, he went the distance and it was a great fight. It was a really even match. And after that third round, like I said, it could have went either way. But if you really watched that first and second round did go to Joaquin and he ended up getting the win. Um, You know, Abdul looked a bit distraught. He like went to the ground afterwards. But Joaquin had nothing but respect for him. You saw it in the last slide. Like he he really appreciated this fight. And, um, you know, I think that they both will grow as fighters in this. I know Abdul's a little bit older, but you know, it looked like he still has a lot of room to grow and a lot left in the tank. So I'm really excited to see these two and what they have to bring. And maybe, maybe they'll meet again. Like, I think that this would be a great um, second fight later on when they get um, better in their careers because they're both, again, they're both still learning. And this was, this was fun to watch. Even though, you know, it was a bit of a burner and it was a lot of wrestling involved, it was still fun to watch. I had a great time with it. But moving on, yo, Jim Miller. (laughs) This is actually one fight that 
I truly, truly enjoyed Jim Miller versus Nicholas Mata. Now, if you watch Jim Miller in these last few fights, at that age, 38 years old, why is he still fighting? Like, what the hell? Like, it's it's clearly pride, but at the same time, Jim Miller's on a streak at 38 years old. You cannot put that age in front of Jim Miller and think that, okay, I'm going to win this fight because he's old. No, this man is still a dog. He is still, like, fighting. But in these last few fights, he's been more known as a submission artist, a grappler, which hasn't always been the case. But because of his age, and you know, like, that happens. You got to transition your game. But, you know, he's still lethal on the feet. But Nicholas Mata has been known as a knockout artist. Like, that's all people knew. So, mistaken, I believe Jim Miller actually came in as the underdog in this fight. Everybody had Nicholas Mata winning by knockout in this. And, man, was that a surprise. This fight was all hands. I didn't see Jim Miller really go for any takedowns. Yeah, there was some wrestling involved, but it was mainly on the cage. But, man, it was amazing. Jim Miller, I'm so impressed. I'm so impressed on how he handled um, his mother. He hit him with a huge, huge left hook that ended up being all she wrote. Once that hook landed, it was all ground and pound from there. It was a little long. I got to say, I thought that the ref was going to step in a little bit earlier, and he didn't. Even Jim Miller was a little upset about it because he was like, you just had him take a little more damage than he needed to. But, you know, he did have his hands up. He looked like he was kind of defending. So I do understand it. But, man, he got the win in a very dominant fashion. This is his 39th win in the UFC. That is tying Donald Cerrone for the most wins in the UFC history. They've been going back and forth. Like, it's kind of hilarious to watch because it's like both of them can stop fighting at any point. And yeah, people know Donald Cerrone more, but if you don't know Jim Miller, you should watch some of his fights because he is very, very entertaining. He may not have those classic matches like Donald Cerrone, unfortunately, but that doesn't mean that um, Jim Miller isn't a great fighter. And he's been proving that as of late because unlike Donald Cerrone, Jim Miller's been climbing. Donald Cerrone has been the one that's been, you know, kind of going down. So this might be Jim Miller's last, you know, run to, to do something, to get some recognition. I'm sure that, you know, we're going to see him in, in his next fight maybe get some, um, some uh, I don't want to say top five opponent. That's kind of him. But, you know, I think that he's going to get another tough opponent just to see where he's at because we don't know if he really is a gatekeeper or if he's trying to make a run. You know, it was at first I thought that he was a gatekeeper, but he's been running through everybody. Anybody that's been promising, especially somebody like Nicholas Mata, who was super promising before this, didn't lose, um, had all dominant performances, all knockouts, basically. For Jim Miller to come out and dismantle him the way that he did, this changes your opinion on somebody. Even if that age is there, he clearly has some more to give. So you might want to give him some some uh you know some respect maybe let him get a little bit of a run i wouldn't mind it i kind of want to see it so you know i would love to um see what they do with him in the near future now you know we can't have a um a fight without having some heavyweights involved you already know how this was gonna go parker porter versus alan bodell um all heavy hitting. What can you say? All heavy hitting. I'm surprised nobody got dropped. But Porter did a great job in his technique, man. Like, uh, I think Alan Bodeau had a greater stand-up ability, and Parker picked up on it because he was getting hit with some bangers. If we're being honest, there was no real answer for um, Parker. So the only answer that there could be was wrestling going for wrestling if if you if you don't win in the stand-up you have to find something else that's the name that should be the lesson in this um in this fight night if you can't strike or if your striking isn't winning do something else figure it out and that's what we saw happen parker porter did an outstanding job in his intelligence and being humble enough to be like okay he may have it in the stand-up 
but I can get him in other things. And he did. He got him in the wrestling, and that was really mainly the fight. Like, you can see he he was able to dodge a few, but most of the time, like, even this exchange, it was to get to them legs and try to take him down. Um, I was actually landing a lot more in that third round, if we're being completely honest. It was a lot of, of heavy hitting, a lot of big punches that I thought were going to put Parker out. He was bleeding a lot from the nose, but, you know, Parker was able to continue to, you know, withstand that onslaught and get the takedown, which that was that was the, the end of the fight right there. Once he got that takedown and was able to keep Alan Boudreau on the ground for the rest of that last round, like once once something like that happens, it's it's a point game. He was more dominant, and that's what the refs are looking for. Yeah, you had it in the striking, but he already knew that, so he took the striking away from you, and you weren't able to do anything. This is a points game, so you know that's that's where all of this comes into play. That's why you know the technique of it really is showing as of late in the UFC, and I love it. I love that people are now starting to realize, you know, I don't have to get CTE to win a fight. I don't have to be continuously getting hit in the head to win or be interesting because this was still a fun fight. Wrestling is fun, you know? It may not be knockouts, but watching somebody really dominate somebody is also really cool. And then if you see somebody who's on the ground is still able to, you know, fight, that's equally as fun. You know, it doesn't always have to be hands. If you're just looking at hands, go to boxing. You know, like there's there's so much more at play in MMA. And I think that it's really good that we're starting to see that as a majority in the sport. I had a really good time watching this card just because of that alone. I think that this signifies a change in MMA where it's now becoming the sport that it should have been instead of just an entertainment factor. The people who are watching it now have been around MMA and all sorts of martial arts to the point where they know like a a, not a decent amount but a general idea of what all the different fighting styles can bring and one of the biggest things that aren't really ventured in or respected is wrestling and jujitsu but because that over oversight because of that oversight that's been exploited as of late and i love it I love that that's been the case. So um, after, you know, a close little decision, wrap it up, Parker Porter got the win. Um, not much to say other than that. I knew that that was going to happen. I think everybody knew that Parker Porter was going to win, unless you were just looking at the striking. But the striking was not enough to get the win. Parker Porter did more than enough to get that win, and I would have been more upset and shocked if he didn't. But moving right along to Kyle Dawkins and Jamie Pickett, this was a shocker. This was the second biggest shocker of the night. Now, this was the co-main event. And, I mean, I truly was not expecting for how this fight was going to go, if I'm being completely honest. Now, I knew that there was going to be a lot of wrestling. I knew that from the jump. These guys are both good wrestlers. Kyle Dawkins is known for his wrestling. Kyle was very good at, you know, trying to defend that takedown. He has very good balance, but he wasn't good enough to stop that takedown. And Dawkins, once he exploded that, just kept that going, kept going for those takedowns, which is something that we haven't seen. It was kind of like, you know, Ngannou taking down Cyril Gain, which we hadn't seen. So it was interesting to see um, Kyle Dawkins do this to, to Jamie Pickett in a way that Jamie Pickett really didn't have any answers. And the most surprising thing, though, was the fact that Dawkins was able to submit Jamie Pickett with a Darcy choke. Now, he got this choke within, like, I want to say 20 seconds of the end of the first round. Jamie Pickett submit. He tapped in with less than a second left on the clock. Literally, he tapped as the bell rang. He was trying to hold out. And I think that he tapped or he thought that he was tapping when the bell rang, but it was literally right before. Unfortunately for him, he was probably better off going to sleep. But I don't even think that was that kind of choke. I think that that was all throat. If I'm being completely honest, that's what it looked like. But, man, I I couldn't believe it. 
I don't think anybody could believe it. If you, that's an anomaly. You never see somebody tap that close to the end. It always is like, I guess that like this is my life until the bell rings. Once you hear that 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 gavel to let you know there's ten seconds left, there's no tapping. Are you kidding me? You wait. You just hold it out. But you know, credit. I gotta give credit to Kyle Dawkins. He he held the faith and got the win. That was a really impressive finish. Cause like I said, you don't ever see that. You don't see that kind of win. And for him to to get that, I'm honestly impressed. That just keeps his streak going. You know, this is a learning lesson for Jamie Pickett. Don't tap in the last 10 seconds, man. You heard the gavel. You knew that that, that round was gonna end. You were gonna be able to cover in the corner. You'd have been fine. You had half a second. Literally, he started tapping right when the bell rang. There was no getting saved. You already tapped. I was, uh, yeah. I don't. I had mixed emotions, but I was, I was more so impressed at the fact that Kyle Douglas got it. But I was also mad at the fact that Jamie Pickett tapped because you know, you just you 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 had the next round. The next round was gonna happen. This wasn't the last round. This was the very first round. So that's what made it kind of. I don't know. It was a bit frustrating. It was a bit frustrating because that fight could have went on. But, you know, I understand. I understand. I've been putting a few chokes that I couldn't get out of and immediately was like, nope, I'm not dealing with this. Even if it was uncomfortable, I was like, I don't feel like, you know, I don't want to keep this up. F that, no. So I feel like that also may have been, you know, the deciding factor. But, again, you're in the UFC. It's a bit different than me. But let's get into that main event, man. This was the biggest shock, in my opinion. Johnny Walker versus Jamal Hill. Let's be honest. We all thought that Johnny Walker was going to dog Jamal Hill. This was going to be a striking clinic between the two of them. That much we already knew. And that was what it really was in the beginning. I mean, I knew that Johnny Walker and Jamal Hill both had amazing stand-up. But... Johnny Walker has proven to be a monster, you know, in the light heavyweight division. And his striking has always been impeccable. There's only so much more improvement that you can get when it comes to somebody like Johnny Walker. So I think that the odds were really against um, Jamal Hill here. And he was cool, calm, and collected, man. Like, did not care. And, you know, he kept his own in that first round to the point where Johnny Walker had to resort to his wrestling. But, I mean, you can see Jamal was like, yeah, here we go. I knew this was going to happen. And he has some wrestling background of his own. And, you know, it was pretty stalemated until Hill hit him with the meanest right hand I have seen in a long time. I won't say ever seen. But, man, I've never seen – I haven't seen a delayed knockout like that in a minute. I mean, he got hit, and we all were like, ooh. And then all of a sudden, Johnny Walker's hands kind of flew up after, like, a few seconds after that hit. And you could tell he was out. He was he was gone before he even hit the mat. Once this hit his temple, he was already knocked out. But when you saw it in real time, it looked like he was still ready to fight. And I think that that was just autopilot, but autopilot failed. That is 100% sure. What a knockout. From Jamal Hill. That is a statement piece right there. And he even said that. People need to stop sleeping on Jamal Hill. And I'm one of them. I got to be honest. He was number 12. Johnny Walker was number 10 in the rankings. And Jamal Hill made a statement. I need to be up there in the top 10. Like, the man's power is unprecedented. For him to do what he did against Johnny Walker, that was amazing. That was super impressive. And I am super excited to see what this man can bring. Like, he took all the momentum of Johnny Walker and snatched it, completely snatched it for himself. I'm so excited to see what Jamal Hill got. Um, And, you know, he even said it himself. He said he's ready. He wants to to prove all the naysayers wrong and wants to show everybody what he can do. So, you know, I'm I'm more than excited to see that. I'm, I'm ready. So to wrap it up, man, you know how we do the ratings. Um, one to five stars, five stars being fight forever, four stars. This is awesome. Three stars. You still got it. Two stars is what? And one star is boring. Like, don't watch it. You're not going to have a good time. You're better off watching me or one of the other guys on this channel. 
Um, like I said, I don't have any complaints on this. This was a surprise. I don't know if I would give it a four. I feel like a four is a bit much, but I also feel like a three is a bit low. It's one of those in-betweeners. So, but I do feel more comfortable giving it a three. I don't like doing halves because that's cheating. So I do feel more comfortable giving it, giving it a three. So I'll give it a three. It was a great showing. It was a great performance. Um, it was really, really solid. And it had a lot of surprises in there. Um, I feel like if there were a few more um, big wins, I'd say, or big finishes, I would give it a four. But, you know, um, even though I do like technical side of MMA, I am like you guys. I want to see finishes. I don't want to see fights all go the distance. That is boring. You know, we want to see definitive wins um, more than we do uh, decisions. So with that being said, you know, if there were a few more of those finishes, I would have definitely gave this a four. There was just too few finishes for my liking, but the finishes that we did see were all awesome that that was they were all great and they were all exciting finishes and they were all big surprises and after after what i've seen man you know the ufc i've said this before they got some talent coming up you know it's time to like continue the trend of you know just let's keep watching these new guys pay attention to the prelims man these prelims are showing a lot of really good fighters and these really good fighters are going to have their chance to come up and they just might shock you. Like when we see, um, who did I say? I got to go back up. Who am I watching from the prelims? Hmm. Not Chad Skelly. Chad Skelly is apparently done. Not Chad. Who was it? I can't remember who I said. Well, that's telling, I guess. <laughs> but um, man, it was somebody from the prelims. Why can I not remember? Um, oh, Dawkins, or was it Chad? I can't remember. Whoever had a really dominant performance, I just can't remember the name. But with these, that's kind of the issue with the prelims. You don't pay too much attention, but you should still watch. So when you see their face instead of their name, you know, you, you get an idea of still like, oh, that's that guy. Like he's gonna have some problems with him. But even even though you like, I can't think of, of a way to put this. Like, even though the prelims don't have the gigantic names, that doesn't mean that they can't fight and be entertaining. That just means they're new. This is a way for all of us to be introduced, including the officials and the people in charge of matchmaking so that we get the best bang for our buck, especially when it comes to those um, pay-per-views. So we have to watch the prelims, guys. Definitely watch it. Get in early on these bandwagons. You don't want to hop on too late. You don't want to be that guy. So please, please give these guys a chance because more often than not, they're way more entertaining than people give them credit for. And even sometimes they're better than the main cards. Because like I said earlier, them fighters are a lot more hungry. The pay is a little bit different. So they have a lot more to prove. But, you know, with that being said, that's all I have for today. Um, like, follow, subscribe, of course, to take it to the ring. And, of course, the All Real Crew so you can see more of me. Most definitely, um, I'll be doing In The Mix, All Real Crew. I do a lot of wrestling, mainly Monday Night Raw, Friday Night SmackDown, NXT. I do it all, man. So, and also check out my crew, man. Everybody involved does a really good job of reporting. So you will no doubt have a great time with this channel. We give it all to you. And, you know, we don't, we don't hold back. All of it is real. I won't even say that the All Road crew does it all. It's, it's literally all of us. We just got the name. So definitely check us out, guys. And, def and also leave comments. We do respond and we always engage. So um you know leave a comment on you know, your your favorite fight of the ufc or you know what events you're looking forward to it doesn't even have to just be ufc if you want me to cover some other stuff i'll gladly do so let me know what you think show me what you got but until then guys catch me later on 11 o'clock because i will be covering gcw and that's wrestling guys so definitely watch that one i'll see you at 11 and until then
guys.